uh, his or her mother, will never smile at another human being as they come in the room, will never communicate in any way, will not feel anything either. Um, is that a person? Yes. Why isn't it a person? Well, because I don't think that the, the I mean, the, the only thing that we can say about this child is that biologically it's a member of our species born to human parents. Um, I think the notion of personhood, and this is not incidentally original to me, this is something that goes all the way back through philosophers like John Locke, in fact to early Christian philosophers like Boethius who were debating what it is to be a person when they discussed the doctrine of the Trinity. And they said, well, a person is a, a rational substance. So this baby with no brain um, is not a rational substance. It's not rational now. It never will be rational. You don't accept, obviously, the traditional notion of the sanctity of human life. What's obviously. wrong with that idea? Well, as I said, it's speciesist. I mean, it's, it's limited to human beings. It, it says that biologically being a member of the species Homo sapiens is enough to make your life more sacred, more entitled to protection than the life of, for example, a chimpanzee who is not a member of our species, who is far more self-aware, far more rational, far more capable of emotionally connecting with other beings, with loving uh, her child, let's say, if it's a female chimpanzee, um, than uh, a, a human being with uh, an encephaly, the condition we were talking about, uh, could ever be. Um, that seems to me just, just a, a mere prejudice in favor of members of our species. A being with Alzheimer's, a human being with Alzheimer's. This was a personal experience of your own with your, your late mother. My mother uh, did unfortunately suffer from Alzheimer's in, towards the end of her life. Yes. And, and, and I think some critics, in a sense, used that example to criticize you further and suggested that um, your response to your mother was somehow inconsistent with your own moral perspective. Yes, um, and I'm not, I mean, I think they were uh, a bit muddled as to in what way they thought it was inconsistent. I mean, certainly there's nothing in my view that says that we ought to kill beings who are not persons. I mean, that would be absurd. I don't think that's true of non-human animals either. So it's not that, um, I, you know, I don't think anybody could say, well, it's consistent with my view that I ought to have ended my mother's life when she lost self-awareness. Um, the more serious criticism, I think, connects to a different aspect of my views, and that is that I've argued strongly that uh, we ought to be doing a lot more to help people in developing countries uh, who are desperately poor and whose lives we can save by giving them some of the money we have. So, of course, it cost a, a significant amount for me to, uh, for me and my sister, I should say, it wasn't only me, to maintain my mother and care for her. And so I think there is probably a, a, a criticism that does actually connect with things that I've said that says, well, was this expenditure worth it? And in that sense, I think the criticism of uh, what my sister and I did for my mother is more like, you know, the criticism that I might incur um, if I uh, spend money on some luxury that I don't really need. Uh, and, you know, to that I certainly plead guilty, yes. I'm, I'm not perfect in either of those respects. Some would see your reaction to your mother in this case as actually an example of morally laudatory behavior, not a, not a sign of imperfection. Yes, I know they would because um, they have a, a strong view about obligations of uh, people to their families and those who are close and they have very little sense of obligation towards strangers. I guess I'm different uh, to some extent. I obviously do think that you know, it's, it's normal and natural and, and not something that we should reject for people to be concerned about their families and their children and to, to do more for them than they do for strangers. But, but I think that there are limits to that. And I perhaps see uh, a stronger obligation to be impartial in terms of what we do to save lives and uh, to reduce the burden of disease and, and misery and suffering. And I think that uh, now that we have a more globalized world in which we can know very well what people are suffering in distant continents and we can have uh, non-government organizations like Oxfam or whatever it might be to get assistance to them, um, I think that uh, we ought to be doing much more than we are. Um, UNICEF says that 30,000 children under five a day die from preventable causes, 10 million a year. Um, and certainly there are a lot of adults as well who die from uh, causes that are preventable. So uh, if we could relatively easily, um, just by giving away a small amount of what we earn, some of the luxuries that we 
spend money on daily without even thinking about it. Restaurant meals, theatre tickets, uh, vacations in foreign countries, uh, even things like uh, buying bottled water when there's perfectly drinkable, safe water coming out of the tap. Um, you know, all of those things are luxuries that uh, a billion people in the world could never dream of having and that could actually be life-saving for some of those people. So, you know, murderer, that's a strong term, but, but certainly callously indifferent. Uh, well, people to, are dying. Yes, people are dying and there is something that we could be doing about it. And, you know, you can have murder by uh, neglect, I guess. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I want to say it's, it's certainly part of that same spectrum. How much do we need to do, in terms of someone who has an average income, how much does that person need to do to avoid criticisms of moral indecency or quasi-murderer status? Well, I mean, I, you know, in a way I think it's surprisingly small. I think if, if people of average income were to give 10% of what they earn to organisations working for a developing country, and if those with significantly above average income were to give something more, you know, maybe 20% or whatever, um, we could, I think, quite comfortably deal with the large-scale extreme poverty around the world. In fact, probably it wouldn't even really need the 10% if everybody was contributing. Some estimates go as low as 2%. But, um, but given that not everybody is contributing, um, in practical ethics uh, some years ago, I suggested this sort of tithe, the traditional 10%, as something that, you know, if people were to give, well we could certainly say they've, they've made a significant gesture. That's, that's something substantial. It's not just throwing a few coins in a box when it's waved under your nose. And uh, uh, they, could, they could certainly claim to have done their fair share. I, I know you, you're going to say, I don't want the, the perfect to be the enemy of the good here, and giving something is better than giving nothing. But okay. if, if I've paid all of my bills, if I've met all my costs in terms of my standard of living, uh, why 10%? Why not 30%? Why not 40%? And, and can I ever legitimately have a second home or a second car? You know, I mean, it's the term legitimately here, I guess, that is the problem. I mean, I think that uh, certainly, ideally, you, while other people are starving, you should not have a second home or a second car. And, uh, you know, that's something that we should aspire to. But I'm not going to criticize you if you do give 10% and you nevertheless have enough for that second home or second car. Because I'm certainly you know, very far from doing all that I should do myself. So you have a second home? Um, uh, I guess, in a sense, I, I do together with, together with others, a shared uh, place, yes. Um, so, yeah, you know, I mean, that's, that's a luxury that I could do without. Um, I agree. Uh, and so that's why I'm not really going to criticize people. I think there's, there's a there's a problem, if you like, of simply overcoming things that are part of our nature, which are to look towards ourselves and our family more than we really should. And uh, I think as long as we're conscious of that and we're trying to do more and to gradually perhaps increase the amount we're giving while others are in such need, uh, you know, I think that's enough to say that you're behaving in a morally decent way. These are fascinating ideas, and we're sitting here in Princeton University, and you're a Princeton philosophy professor. And the ideas have a certain context here in that you're exploring your own moral principles to the nth degree, following the logic of it. And you're often complimented for following the logic of your own argument wherever it takes you to, however unpalatable to other people that conclusion might seem. I just wonder what the world would look like if these ivory towered ideas as they currently are were to become enacted in law if people were to act in practice in the way that Peter Singer is describing as a moral life. Look, I'd, I'd reject the ivory towered uh, claim. I mean, the ideas that we've been talking about are in practice in, you know, by significant numbers of people um, in a lot of different countries. Uh, so we have lots of people who are vegetarians or vegans um, for ethical reasons. Uh, as far as the views about euthanasia are concerned, I mean, some of those are in practice in the Netherlands, I think with generally satisfactory results, which is why the neighbour of the Netherlands, Belgium, followed a similar law a few years ago. Um, some of the others are uh, actually in practice but not openly discussed because of legal ramifications. Uh, in terms of what we're talking about, about uh, dealing with global poverty, uh, again, there's a lot of people who are doing quite a significant amount in that area. So um, I think that 
while they're not all going to be put into practice overnight, and that would be a drastic revolution, maybe too drastic, because we couldn't cope with those changes all at once, I think the idea that these things which already exist out there in the world should become more prevalent would be a, a wonderful thing, would greatly reduce the amount of unnecessary suffering in the world.